<laughs> that's a massive red flag for me. Because first of all, that's exactly what they're doing. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and we're talking about He Gets Us and why it's good and why it's bad. Coming up next. Whenever you're watching this, thank you for joining me, taking some time out of your day. I appreciate it. I really do. Um, <clears throat> I usually do these shows for those who are new uh, on Fridays. And uh, this type of kind of cultural commentary regarding church, denominations, culture, society, sometimes government, politics stuff, though I don't do as much of that. Uh, not because I don't have opinions, I just, I just don't focus on that. We're going to be talking about He Gets Us. This is something that we see so often. We see the hundred million plus dollars, hundreds of millions of views, Super Bowl ads, the bright colors, the black and white imagery, the yellow, the black, the very, the very stark contrast. I love their marketing. I have a background in graphic design uh, and restaurants, both <laughs> uh, two different things. But nevertheless, I did marketing and design stuff off and on in different capacities for churches, ministries worked for a motorcycle like extreme sports uh, company for a while Uh, i've done many websites and business cards letterhead all sorts of things and he gets us top notch a plus it's like the chosen with a tv show it's very very good quality uh the costumes are great the cinematography is great acting's great the message but i've done some stuff on the chosen if you want you can check out some things up here He gets us, though, is on first, you think, wow, this is great. This is great. So let's just look at it because just so we're all on the same page and why I think there's good parts. Those are some of the good parts right off the bat. Uh, The marketing is phenomenal. And you might be thinking, well, so you don't so you like the marketing of Jesus. That's just bad. What about the second commandment? What about this? What about this? Well, I'm not going to talk about the second commandment here, but that's not what this is at all. Um, You have a bulletin a church website, a little, you know, turn and burn sign outside, or, you know, Jesus loves you, or a little pin that says that, or a shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. Ask me about Jesus. You're reading your Bible. That's all marketing. So marketing is not my problem. Marketing is not why this is bad. Marketing Jesus, we all market Jesus. We think, you know, like something like philosophy automatically, it's a bad word. All philosophy is bad. No, bad philosophy is bad. Good philosophy is good. Right. Paul tells us in Colossians, don't be captivated, you know, be, be renewed in your mind. That's Romans, but, but have a good philosophy. Black, got a guy here, black guy, not the same thing I'm talking about, but you know what I mean? Black and white imagery, really good. Simple. He gets us. Now the focus there right off the bat also is us. Oh, it's us. Interesting. So it's not he, why is the yellow on us and not he? Is this about Jesus or is it about us? He gets us, has an agenda. Jesus didn't want us to act like adults. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, yeah, be sure. Jesus loved the people we hate. Is that Elizabeth Warren? It looks like Elizabeth Warren, Senator from Massachusetts. Be childlike, love your enemies, all love. Articles, Jesus didn't want us to act like adults. We're not going to look at any of these things. You can. He gets us dot com. Obviously that happens. You curious about that. You want that. You want to see that. You want to see hatred for Christ. Go to Ethiopia uh, or Nigeria, rather Ethiopia, some, but Nigeria, especially Nigeria is huge. It's like half Muslim, half Christian. And there's constant wars. I mean, like Christians die there every day. Christians, Muslims, no doubt, probably die too, but they're probably dying in jihad. But for us to have this kind of weird, twisted, like Americanized version of like persecution and problems, oh, this is so bad. The world and history are so much different than the last 200 years or so of our culture and our context. Yes, it's bad now. I get it. It's very bad. Uh, There's much division. There's, you know, black and white, left and right, this and that, all this, you know, Christian, non-Christian, as if Christians are the ones causing the problems. 
No, it's the godless pagans that cause the problems. <laughs> now, Christians, we sin too. Yes. But if you're seeking to walk with the Lord, you're told to be at peace with all people. So far as it depends on you, right? This isn't just a Bible verse for your six-year-old to not hit his you know, younger sister. This is about living at peace with your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Jesus is asked, right? Who's this? Your closest neighbor, your wife, gentlemen, ladies, your husband. He is your closest neighbor. So don't disrespect him. Don't be a don't be a jerk. Don't be, you know, blowing money or this or that behind his back. Men, likewise, lead your wives and love with love them, live with them in an understanding way. They're your closest neighbor. But we don't we don't want to we want to look at like this out kind of nebulous sort of thing. Same thing with revival. We want revival, but, you know, out there, away, not for me. Hopefully talking to someone tomorrow uh, about revival, the Asbury revival. We're going to do that live. So look out for that. Do a question and answer midday on Saturday, March 4. If you're watching this afterward, you can still watch it, of course, on YouTube, but you won't get the live questions. But you can drop a question in the comments, I guess. So back to He Gets Us. We see here. You know, again, it's so good. Hashtag hope. Jesus invited everyone to sit at his table. Okay. Yeah, sure. Tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners. Okay. Struggled. Did Jesus live in poverty? How did Jesus deal with injustice? Activists. Jesus was fed up with politics too. This campaign. Is this a campaign to get me to go to church? Nobody wants to be preached to or pressured by somebody else. <laughs> That's a massive red flag for me. Because first of all, that's exactly what they're doing. Now, oh, I don't preach at me. Preacher, oh, you're a pastor, Baptist pastor. Oh. I don't care. That doesn't matter. I, the world and the gospel, everything will still go on when I'm long gone. Okay? My children are long gone. My grandchildren are long gone. If the Lord tarries, right? Which he will, probably. <laughs> but anyway. I don't know, we preached that. Nobody wants to be told what to do. You're telling me what to do right here. You're telling me these things. You're telling me these things about Jesus and this and this and this, and you're not anchoring them in any Bible. But let's just let's just be clear. Let's make me a little smaller here. Let's look at this. Uh, how about Jesus was fed up with politics too? Let's read this. Let's see how much. So there's a guy here, American flag. I don't know what this is. This guy on the left, the right. What's he preaching? I don't know. Politics. Jesus was born in the height of the Roman Empire's power. They conquered most of the known world. Israel was no exception. Unlike previous empires that would try to destroy culture by displacing, Romans didn't force people to change their religion or customs as long as they kept their obligations. Correct. Okay, so they have scripture references. That's a plus. I was not expecting scripture references, to be totally honest. Yeah, so Judas was a zealot, but not Judas Iscariot. Oh, wow. Let me look, read this closer, though. In the end, it took all three of these groups to have him killed. A zealot, <laughs> Judas, betrayed his location to those seeking to arrest him. The Sadducees brought him up before the Romans to be executed. Okay, so right off the bat, let's go ahead and correct that, unless my memory is wrong. Luke 6.15. Get more context. Luke 6.15 I didn't plan on this. Simon, who was named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Okay, so it doesn't say he's a Zealot. <laughs> Simon, who was called the Zealot there, pretty sure there was only one Zealot. That was a religious group. That's why you're called a Zealot. Oh, man, that guy's a Zealot. Religious Zealot. We still use it today. Um... Simon the Zealot, Matthew 10, 4, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, man. See, this says Acts 22, being a zealot for God. Simon the Zealot, Andrew, Philip. Yeah, so right off the bat, that is really, really bad. Massive. That's just like an extra little, that's just a little extra dessert. That was bonus. All right, let's get into the more context, though, because... Ooh, so far we they've struck out related articles. Jesus invited everyone to his table. Cool. Forgive me, my allergies are a little wonky. Pretty tingly. So they got more re references, but it's, the verse references don't really uh, don't really focus on the most 
significant parts of this context and what they're saying. I mean, we just saw that with the last one. Maybe it's different here. I'm not going to read it for time. You can go to it. He gets us.com. So, all right. I want us articles about us. So let's look at this. He gets us is a movement to reintroduce people to Jesus of the Bible. Okay. So of the Bible, great. You know, but do you use Bible? Are you telling people to go to these? Do you have like affiliate churches that are pro proclaiming the truth? Now, Ed Stetzer, who's a piece of work, um, and uh, Kevin Ezell, who's a larger piece of work of the North American Mission Board, Ed Stetzer's at Wheaton College, I think. They're both they're both conservative. Sorry, they're both conservative, quote unquote, but they're not. Uh, not by their actions, but people think they are as far as what they say, but not what they do. So uh, who's paying for all this? Let's see here. He gets us. So, I mean, this is Times Square, right? Like there's there's massive billboards, all sorts of stuff. And again, marketing is fine. Great, good, market. Now, Psalm 19 and Romans 1, God doesn't need marketing though, right? He also doesn't need marketing. We get it. This is a unique effort. Funding for He Gets Us comes from a diverse group of individuals, entities with a common goal. Most of the people driving He Gets Us, including our donors, chose to remain anonymous. That's always kind of weird. Uh, story isn't about them. Yeah. Okay. The people pouring out their time, energy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just vague. That's kind of like the Watchtower Society. Oh, you can't see that. Oh, oh well. Um, it's like the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah Witnesses. Because they don't actually say anything. They mistranslate the Bible and they have all their own authority. Bad news. Bad news. Remain anonymous right there. Interesting. So, seven reasons why, though, I don't think this is good. I think this is bad. And, you know, oh, Baptist pastor. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor, no less. You know, you're a white, cisgendered male, heterosexual, married to, you know, a biological woman with four biological kids who aren't trans and queer, gender non-conforming, non-binary. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The word of God is the standard. I'm not the standard. You're not the standard. One of the guys, the founders, Lee, I think is his last name. He's not the standard. Ed Stetzer, Kevin Ezell, they're not the standard. Bad atrocities made by Christians in the past aren't the standard. Good things, Constantine, George Washington, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther King Jr., R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, whatever. These guys aren't the standard either. Christ is the standard. Jesus is the standard. So we'll look at some of these videos as I get closer. So I want us to look at, though, more detail. Right. So we looked at the website. So number one. Number one, he gets us is 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 seen as overall, so it's focused on us, not he, but us. It's all about us. Now, God did send Jesus into the world, right? We live in the world. Some people say, well, the gospel, you have a man-centered gospel. Well, in one sense, the gospel is man-centered, <laughs> right? Christ is sa saving man, mankind, right? Not himself. He doesn't need saving. So in one sense, it is. Now, I understand what they're trying to get at when they say that, but sometimes it's a little silly because you can take it and turn it on its head. And that doesn't really help your argument if an argument can be turned over so easily. But his full identity is really kind of vague, right? This is more kind of the leftist, progressive, liberal Christian view of Jesus and not something else. It's not enough for Jesus to understand us, quote unquote, as a great moral teacher, right? Gandhi, Buddha, Joseph Smith, MLK, all could have done this too, right? I hope. You're saying, right. So that's number one. It, it, it's not enough for him to just get us, okay, to get, oh, Jesus understands. Well, if Jesus isn't God, who really cares? Number two, red letter Christianity is 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 in full force. Now, we don't use that term as much. I'm writing a book. <laughs> I've been writing it for a couple of years now. I need to do it. Somebody encourage me in the comments, please. Tell me to write my book. Um, about, you know, I, I don't focus on Paul. I focus on Jesus, Jesus's words. So there's this Peter and Paul, uh, Paul and Jesus, and there's this conflict. Remember, Jesus didn't write any of the Bible. Paul, Peter, John, James, Jude, Luke, 
uh, Mark, Matthew, they wrote the Bible, New Testament. Well, again, number two, does it matter if Jesus was ever lonely? Does it matter that he ever had fun or faced criticism? Was Jesus ever stressed? Is what it says. It's like, well, yeah, but like, that's not the point. <laughs> like MLK was probably those things. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Joseph Smith, Buddha, Gandhi, Genghis Khan, Mao Zedong, right? Like bad, good, evil, righteous, whatever. Like, so what? These are just men. And if Jesus is just a man, well, you know, eat, drink for you tomorrow, you die. doesn't matter. He's not just our example, though. He is an example, but he's not just our example. He is man, but he's not just man. And that's the thing. A lot of fundamentalists, you know, conservative Bible believing Christian, whatever you want to call us. Oh, God, Jesus, God, 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 God. And we're like, yeah, but he was man. And then other people on the left are like, oh, Jesus was man. He's man, man, man. Uh, maybe he was God. Yeah, he's probably God, I guess. But I don't know. You know, he's both. 100% both. That's the hypostatic union is the fancy word for it. And it's been taught and believed for literally thousands of years. It's not new. Number three. Number three. This is a classic Jesus versus God's word scenario. One of the founders of He Gets Us. Our goal is to give a voice to the pent-up energy of like-minded Jesus followers. Those who are in the pews and those who aren't. Who are ready to reclaim the name of Jesus from those who abuse it to judge, harm, and divide. Happens all the time. Right. All the time. Ah, you're just bad. You're just bad Christians. You bad Christians. I'm a good Christian because I don't go to church. I don't give money to the local church or to uh, pregnancy centers or to international missions or you know sharing the gospel, preaching, praying for people, sharing gospel tracts, having Bible studies in my house. I don't do any of that stuff. Ah. But I'm a good Christian because I don't go to church and I don't do anything Christians are supposed to do. What? <laughs> Obviously, that doesn't work. But this is what progressive Christianity does. As if Jesus did not imbibe the Old Testament and preach it, the law and preach it, right? Isaiah, he opens, he quotes Deuteronomy, he quotes the Psalms. He's affirming their Bible, which is the Old Testament scriptures. So we can't unhitch it. Sorry, Drew, Andy, old Andy Stan, and many others. This is not against Jesus. Yes, sweetheart. <laughs> But many in this culture and movements like this see biblical Christians as the problem. And they see Jesus detached from the Bible and the church as if, you know, Jesus is this, this amorphous thing kind of out there, you know, the, the spirit of Jesus or this. And that's that's a belief, which we won't get into, but that's a belief that people have that aren't Christian, but that's the Christ spirit, the Christ divinity, the God, whatever, you know, coming upon the man, Jesus. We can have that spirit too, blah, blah, blah. But God's word is within the pages of the word of God, right? The Bible. Jesus is within the page. How else are we going to know Christ most effectively, most specifically? Could he reveal himself? Sure. People claim that all the time. Is that happening? I don't think so. Sure, could it? Yes, it could. But does it? No. Usually it doesn't seem to be because it's not comporting with what happens in scripture. So they want to take back from Jesus and the followers. For what? How did we do that? What are we doing? What is it so bad? Like, yeah, you quoted some Bible verses, but you're not saying we know Christ from the scriptures. We see this time and time again. First Corinthians 15, Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was raised according to the scriptures. If he's not resurrected, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. We are of all people most to be pitied. That's not the only place that that's mentioned, but it's countless places about the resurrection. By his wounds, we are healed. By his stripes, the KJV says. Not his life, not his good teaching. Okay? Sorry, liberal Christian, number three, progressive Christians. You guys are wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. It's not just Jesus' example. Example, Yes, example is great, but he also flipped over tables. He also called people dogs and foxes, which fox is not. You know, a sexual term, it's another version of dog. Cling to me, come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's not come wherever and just do whatever and do what, ah, 
No, come to Christ. That's very exclusive. They want some fictional Jesus that didn't exist, palatable Jesus, that everyone can love without having to change their life and confess their sin. Give up their money, give up their time. Number four, but they leave out a lot of other things. So they like a lot of the stuff, but they leave out other stuff they don't like. As if Jesus was some sort of hippie walking around with long hair, you know, tie-dye robe, peace and love, bro, hacky sack, maybe some Birkenstocks. You know, just, you know, just, you know, just, you know, you know, Jesus is fed up. I'm fed up with politics too, guys. I'm a, I'm a refugee too, bro. Just chill, bro. Bro, bro. That's all right, bro. No. If you read any of the Gospels for any length of time, more than a page, you're going to see this. And certainly, the Acts of the Apostles, or Acts of the Holy Spirit, if you prefer, Acts, right? The establishment of the church. We see Jesus at the beginning of it ascending. Like good moral teachers don't descend. They don't raise from the dead. They don't heal people. They don't walk on water. They don't raise people from the dead. They themselves don't raise from the dead. The leftist idea that he gets us, they don't really show Jesus in his true light. As if he never tells people to sin no more. Goes and does miracles. Walking on water, right? Raising people. Turning water into wine. Calling people to repentance. Calling people to himself. They say Jesus welcomed everyone at his table. Okay, yeah, prostitutes, the derelicts, sinners, tax collectors, absolutely. But did he say sit there and do no more? Or or continue rather to do what they're doing? No, not at all. He redeemed their life, changed their life. Number five, it goes on. Jesus was fed up with politics too. I've already said this. Jesus lived in the middle of a culture war, it says. And through political systems, though they were different, the greed, the hypocrisy, the oppression of different groups used to get their way were very similar. End quote. Yeah, I mean, but that's not the point, right? That's not the point at all. I mean, if you read the Bible, (laughs) you're going to see, especially the New Testament, especially the Gospels, that is a factor, but that's not the primary thrust, whatever. Jesus did not come to overthrow Rome. Now, he did overthrow Rome, and now he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Rome is no more, and we're still worshiping Christ. We're not worshiping, you know, Augustus Caesar or Julius Caesar or Caliglia, or um, what's the guy during, I can't remember his name, the guy during Acts, and I'm going through, preaching through Acts 18 right now. We're not worshiping those guys. Those guys are long dead, because they're just men. Jesus is a man. He's also God. Jesus is God. He's also a man, right? Because he knows Adam and Eve. He knows the judgment. They don't talk about Adam and Eve. They don't talk about the curse. They don't talk about the fall. They don't talk about global judgment and a flood. They don't talk about any of this stuff. Not that I saw. No, it's not been exhaustive, but the stuff that I have seen has not hinted at it at all. Sure, there's a few Bible verses here and there, but it's all very menial, vanilla, mild, not offensive at all. John 8, 11, no one, sir, she says, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go and leave your life of sin. End quote. So Jesus, that's the, of course, woman caught in adultery. He saves us would be far better than he gets us. He saves us. He saves us. And you could still mush it into some sort of uh, here and now only. And Jesus does save you here and now. Remember, count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Because stuff here passes away. It's broken. It rots. It dies. People die. There's sickness and famine. But Jesus says, in this life you'll have trouble. If you're not in this world, I've overcome the world, though. I've overcome it. I've conquered the grave. I've defeated death. He saves us. Would be significantly better. And you could still use this and push this. And we've got problems here. And this is one of the, I think C.S. Lewis says, with the megaphone, God screaming at us in our affliction, in our problems. Most people suppress the truth. Romans 1, again, tells us. You have to have it to suppress it, right? Like a buoy pushing down in the pool. They suppress it. They push it down. But God screams at us with the disease, with the frustration, with the divorce, with the abuse, with the things, with the politics, with the corruption, with the lies. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something better. I, I want something more. I know I'm cursed I'm, and I'm broken. I'm a sinner. But I just, I long for something more. Right? That if you're longing for something more, a different world that you're then fit for and built for a different world. Right? You have this craving this desire. And God uses that to bring people to himself. 
through affliction. Sometimes people have amazing lives and they live Christian lives and they have no problems, no sin. They never did any drugs. They never slept around. They never got high. They never spoke an ill word in their life and they're living faithfully under the Lord. And some people do that and then they walk off you know, the deep end. And other people are you know, the most debauched, wicked, everything. And then they get saved. They come to Christ and then they're walking with the Lord. He saves us would be far better. Number six, there's no salvation from sin and death, eternal death. It's just justice, 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 you know, climate justice, racial justice, social justice. You can't put a word in front of justice, by the way. You're, you're disqualifying the word justice. Justice is something that in and of itself, like philosophy or, or a man or a woman is built in. The definition is built into it. You don't need to add these other things to it. Once you add something to it, it's no longer that thing. Justice is key with that. And then it's like, all right, Richard, you're saying God doesn't care about justice then. You're God, God doesn't care about us. He just wants us for heaven, right? You know, just heaven, just, you know, focused on heaven. You're no earthly good. No, if you're focused on heaven, you're very much earthly good because you want to proclaim the truth. You want to live unto the Lord. You want to use the time he's given you. And I'm telling you, Christian, build. Now is the time to build. Now is the time to start businesses, plant churches, have a better family life, do family worship, memorize scripture, proclaim the truth, share the gospel, pray with people. Now is the time to build. Get to a place where you can do that. Probably not in a massive city. I've done conversations with that recently on that. It can be done in a city. Don't get me wrong. But God cares about this life. He does care about this world. Jesus added humanity to himself, right? But he was already pre-existent. And this is the difference. They see Jesus, it seems, as just this guy that lived roughly 2,000 years ago. Not the pre-incarnate son of God. Not the second person of the triune Godhead. Not the God, not the word made flesh who dwelt among us, as John tells us. Big difference. Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let the people, let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Holy is he. Not us. He. He. He gets us. No. If anything, it should be focused on he. <laughs> the yellow should be highlighting he, not us. The king. In his might, loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Jacob, they're just a synonym for Israel. God's chosen people. Elect. Excuse me, elect. Although, chosen people, you know what I mean. Exalt, rather. Verse 5 of 99. The Lord, our God, and worship at his footstool. <laughs> Holy is he. This campaign is not about going to a local church. It says that. I don't remember that. Oh, is it time to get, get you to go to church? No, we don't go to church. I don't want to go to church. You know, whether you love Jesus or hate Jesus, you know, we can all agree Jesus was a great guy. You know, we can't all agree on that. And so what if he was a great guy? Gandhi was probably a pretty great guy. MLK did some great stuff, right? Thomas Jefferson, Joseph Smith, uh, founder of Mormonism, probably not. Buddha, I don't know. So what? So what if Jesus was a great guy? If he wasn't who he said he was, you've said it yourself, right? Are you the king of the Jews? He's asked. People say, oh, Jesus never said he was God. Yes, he did. Multiple different times. You just have to know the context. Before Abraham was, I am. It's the same in same words there in Exodus 3, where Moses is there at the burning bush. He says, tell them, I am sent you. Jesus quotes that same verse. Jesus is not a social justice warrior. I'm sorry. He's not. He cared about justice. Yes. That's why he died for sin. That's why he died for those who would come to him. That's why he died for the sins of the world. It all says that, right? Don't get all hung up on one verse or another. Get the whole Bible. But we have this vague, similar kind of mushy idea of like, you know, you know, it, 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 it's like a revisionist sort of history. The further issue I have with he gets us is the vagueness of it. Okay, this leaves Jesus kind of just in this amorphous state, as I said a moment ago. He's just kind of this moral teacher, just floating three, five inches off the ground, touching people. Hey, bro, just peace and love, bro. Peace and love. Got a hacky sack, maybe a little frisbee golf, doing a little thing. Disc golf. Maybe just, you know, just, just, just pal around with the buds. Knock back a couple of brewskis.
read the Bible. Okay. This read the scripture. Now it says, you know, there's a few, and it's got this kind of veneer of Christianity on top. But is that what their focus is? Is that what they're driving towards? No. No, it's all about us. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we got a lot of problems in the world. But Jesus gets us, by golly. Yeah, that makes me okay. It gives me some warm fuzzies. So what? If we hope in Christ for this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Go proclaim the truth. He gets us, people. Lastly, number seven, worldview does matter. Everyone has a worldview. Everybody. Whether you have a good worldview or a bad worldview, that's the difference. But in the West, especially in America, our worldview is wrong. It's very low. It's bad. It's, it's not Christian at all. We're influenced not by the word of God, not by the local church, not by church history and men and women who have come before us, our parents and grandparents who are godly Christians, etc. Rather, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, cable news, celebrities. And you can just see this when you watch some stuff word on the street. You know, who's the vice president? Who is Bush's vice president? Or what's the Bill of Rights? What's the first article in the Constitution? Or worse still, what are the Ten Commandments? What's the Beatitudes? Where can you even find that in the Bible? Most people have zero idea, even people who profess to be Christians. It's sad. Quote an article I found. I discussed with George Barna, it says, in a recent podcast, 65% of Americans identify as Christian. That's pretty low, actually, compared to what it was. I think it was like 80 some odd percent a while back. Anyway, 65% of Americans identify as Christian, with only 6% have a worldview consistent with what the Bible teaches. Dr. Barna's research has also shown the dismal percent of pastors, this is what so, this is what so infuriates me, pastors have a biblical worldview. If you have no theological criteria for where you're sending people, you're actually more likely than not, based on statistics, to sending them to a church whose teachings do not line up with the Bible, end quote. And that's true. Many pastors have a wrong view. I just tweeted yesterday about there's more moms, stay-at-home moms, truck drivers, businessmen, working 50, 60 hours a week, pushing paper, doing whatever, have a better dishwashers, whatever, ditch diggers, single ladies on mission, whatever, living and having far better of a Christian witness and life, more, far more godly than many, many people who fill pulpits all around this world, especially in America. Sometimes it's the pastor is the worst. And the people are never going to rise above the pastor. If they do, they go plant a church, right? They say, my pastor is whack. My pastor is leftist. My pastor doesn't believe the Bible. My pastor is a lesbian. My pastor doesn't know anything. My pastor is, you know, abusing Christ. He's, he's, he's torturing the text of scripture. My pastor is a heretic. Oh, no. Some verses for closing. There's so many. We can go to so many, right? So many. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Colossians 3, 5 through 8, put to death, therefore, what is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Oof. James 1.26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. This religion's, this person's religion is worthless. Peter and Paul in Acts. I'm preaching through Acts at the church I pastor. We're up to Acts 18, which is great. It's been going about two years. Taking some breaks in between. They never compromise the message. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn to Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified, Peter tells them. Paul says, the man he is appointed tells everyone everywhere to repent. Acts 17. That's Acts 2. That's Acts 17. Many people believe. Many people don't. Many people cause a riot. Many people have a hissy fit, right? But many people do believe. Some question, some doubt. Some hate it, and some embrace it. Compromising is never going to get your message anywhere because you're compromising. You're already tainted, like a you know perfect five gallon thing of water, and you just you know put a couple ounces of gasoline in, just a couple ounces. Now right? you got you got whatever gallons of water, and you just put a few ounces of gasoline in. It. Ah, it's not a big deal. Just just drink around it. No, you've compromised. It's done. The whole thing is ruined. Ten gallons, twenty gallons. 
don't want a little gasoline in your water. All that's just a couple ounces of gasoline. What's the big deal? X13. Being good news that God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled in us, their children, by raising Jesus, not his example, but by raising Jesus. Also, it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. Quoting also the Psalms, I will give to you a holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with the fathers and saw corruption. So it's not talking about David, ultimately, right? Talking about Christ, even in the Psalms. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. He gets us. You could do this with your hundred plus million dollar ad campaign. Let it be known. Go back to the Bible. This, through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by everyone who believes is freed from everything which you cannot be freed from by the law of Moses. That's really good news. Very good news. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish, for I, doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells you, end quote. As they went on, the people begged them to say and stay for the next Sabbath. And after the meeting, the synagogue broke up. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. They gathered to hear the word, it says in verse 44. Lastly, we'll give Jesus the last word. There's so many, there's so many. What does Jesus say in Mark 1? You want to talk about Christ? You want to talk about Jesus? Red letter Christians only, blah, 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 fine. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This means good news. This means God saves sinners. There's something, there's a problem. God has the solution. Saying, the time is fulfilled, meaning it's anticipating, right? Jesus says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Not later. Now, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. I hope this was helpful. I pray that I'm helping you through this be against the world for the world. That's the whole impetus of this channel, Contramundum Pro Mundo. So, y'all take care. Have a great day. We'll see you. Yes, you can call her. Give me a hug. Okay. Please shut that door. All right. Yes, son.